everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us um, today. Um, we're excited to have Blair Frazier with us from Lakeside Controls. He's going to be sharing kind of more of a case study um, presentation for us, which we don't do a lot of those, so I'm kind of excited that we've got we've got that for you today. But he's going to be talking about how ultrasound, big data, um, artificial intelligence, how all that is um, been used uh, in the pharma industry and the success that they had, and, and you'll get to see all of that. So, pretty cool topic. Um, obviously, you know the industrial Internet of Things. That's all kind of the hot topic right now. So, so this should be uh, pretty pertinent information for everybody, and, and hopefully a, a a good session for everyone. Um, before I switch over to Blair, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we do have the option for you all to write questions in. So you'll see you've got the little. Um, question box that you can type those in. So send those in throughout the presentation. I'll pop in and, and interrupt Blair if it's a question that um, you know makes sense to get asked before he moves off a topic. And then of course we'll have time for questions at the end of the session as well. Um, also just a reminder we do we are doing this live. We're all here together, um, you know, all over the world. But we're we're here doing this, um, um, you know, live and in person. So bear with us if we do have any technical difficulties. We'll we'll try and get any audio issues or or anything like that uh, resolved as quickly as we can. But um, we do like the live aspect, so so we take that little bit of risk with it. Um, and I am recording this, so for those of you that might have to hop off early or you've got colleagues that couldn't make it, um, I'll pop this up on our website. Uh, later this afternoon so you'll have a chance to to go back and review it or, or like I said share it with a colleague um, and all of that so with that Blair I am going to turn the screen over to you bear with us here there's going to be just a moment of transition All right. We see your screen, Blair, but if you're talking, we don't hear you. Nope. Okay, goodness. Make oh, sure you see your screen. Okay, great. Great. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you for the introduction, Perfect. and thank, thank you, everybody, for joining and taking out of your hour out of your day to uh, listen to me ramble on about this case study. Um, so a brief introduction to myself. I'll keep it simple. Um, I lead the um, reliability business unit at Lakeside Process Controls. We are an Emerson local business partner up in uh, just west of Toronto, Ontario and Canada. Um, but more importantly, it, I think it's more imperative to talk about what I'm not. I'm not a data scientist. Um, I'm not a, a financial guy. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to dive into uh, around the data science side is, is new to me and I spent about a two-year journey um, traveling across the globe on, on, on data science and particular uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, so it, Keep that in mind when I'm going through this. Some of this is, you know, what I've learned, and I'm, I've learned it in my domain, my in industrial knowledge space. Obviously, there's a lot more behind it that um, if, if you are a data scientist or, or practice in that field, you might have some more questions that I will direct over to Cortec.ai that can answer it more on that side. Um, so as we go through this, there was, there was three main players players in this case study. It was Lakeside, who I represent from the reliability side. There was UE systems that we used. their sensors in terms of the ultrasound sensors to, to detect anomalies. And there was Cortic.ai, which provided the um, data ingestion and the artificial intelligence to provide the solution. What was interesting about this journey was I didn't think I needed artificial intelligence. And, and to be honest with you, I really didn't know what that was other than, you know, what are you seeing with um, Zuckerberg and Elon Musk talking about the battle of will it replace all us humans and things like that. That's what I understood artificial intelligence to, to be. And when it came down to it, it was the exact opposite of what I thought it would be. Um, so that, that's what I hope to share the story on. Um, and the, the, one of the biggest things that I've learned from this is, is artificial intelligence and, and what uh, um, Corta calls augmented intelligence is, is really to aid the human in, in, in looking at a large amount of data. So one of the, the best relationships I saw from that is, is um, there was this guy and it was the Iraq war and, and what he did was he was looking at the radar and he noticed um, these blips coming, coming in on the, on, on the radar. And he had, he had to make a, a sorry, that noise is not coming from me. Yeah, hold on a second, let uh, me just uh, mute. Looks like we might have some weird noise coming from someone on the phone. Okay, hopefully that'll go away. <laughs> okay, so, 
That sounds good. So, so what this um, this gentleman did, his job was to look at radar and, and notify the Navy of incoming missiles during the Iraq War. Um, and, and what he happened to see was this split coming in. And the challenge to him was he had to make that split decision whether it was an enemy missile or, or American fighter jet returning back to the, the aircraft carrier. And what was interesting was it was this blip was on the exact same path that an American fighter jet would follow to get back to the aircraft carrier. But what he noticed in that split decision he had to make whether to fire a missile to take that out or not was the pattern of the blips changed, right? And what they ended up determining was that he unconsciously picked up a subtle discrepancy in the timing of the radar signal. So the timing of those blips that he made the decision, that is a missile, we're going to take it out, and he did, and it turned out it was. Thank God it wasn't a, an American fighter jet. But what was interesting about that was he's, he's inundated with data, um, all these blips coming all over the screen, and what he did for the right re reasons was he picked up a very subtle change. Now, we, we take this in the context of our example. You know, that was one, one missile coming in. Um, if that blip represented an asset and each blip represented an anomaly, how would you possibly look at all these subtle changes and patterns that happen? And that's really what we end up doing in this case study. So keep this in mind because I'm going to reference this a few times, either an enemy missile or American fighter jet. So the way I always open up these presentations and, and give this is, is what would it mean to your operations if you took your best maintenance guy or your best operation guy, your best reliability engineer, and all they did was sit there and look at one asset, right? They used their senses. So they used their touch. They used their hearing. They used their sense of smell. Would they be able to detect an anomaly before it actually affected the production? And chances are most people would say yes, but the reality is you can't have just one person dedicated to one asset 24-7, right? And the other thing is, you know, if you could before, and this is, this is meant for a batch, and, and where we solved this was, was in, in, in life sciences, which is very batch process oriented, but the same thing would go through to a continuous process, right? Um, it, what would it mean, would you start a batch if you knew there was anomalies before starting a batch? So what happens in food and beverage and life sciences and those industries, right? You can have a batch that lasts a very long time, and if you have an issue or an anomaly during that long cycle phase, you can end up scrapping that batch. So what if you knew that ahead of time there was a very low confidence of being able to complete that batch? And most people would say, if that's the case, I wouldn't start the batch. I would, I would deal with that anomaly before I started that batch. And the, the biggest feedback I've got from these presentations is so true. If you tell me that there's an issue when I'm during production and you say, okay, this HVAC fan, this pump is going to break in the next hour, that doesn't do me any good, right? I'm still almost, yes, you're, you're telling me ahead of time, but in that case, it's really not predictive maintenance. It's still just reactive maintenance. You just give me an hour to give a heads up, right? What you really want to do is know this ahead of time, and that's, and that's where this is going. Um, so one of the biggest things I've learned on artificial intelligence and IoT is all the people I've talked to, especially in the data science world, talked about, you know, just give me data, and I will give you answers to questions you do me know to ask. And really what I was going in there was saying, well, I have, I have, questions I just need answers to before you even tell me with that. So the idea of, now this is my opinion, and I will break some eggs during this, this webinar on, on, on my opinion on things, but the approach of just collecting your data and whatever data you have and trying to solve problems with that data is not the right approach to, to tackle these new emerging technologies. And, and Chow Wang, who is the chief data scientist of Cortic AI, I think hit the nail on the head when he said, you know, you need to have domain expertise to find, define, to find, define, and design the problems, which is very true, which, which was exactly true to this example. Without the domain knowledge coming from the equipment manufacturer, coming from the reliability engineers, coming from the production people, this problem would not have been solved. So get into the case study. This case study was in a, in a um, pharmaceutical company up here in, in Toronto, and it was a simple ask, well, I shouldn't say simple, but a very common ask to me as the reliability provider saying, we've done a risk assessment of all of our critical assets, and, and here's 20 of the most critical assets we have. We want to focus in on this autoclave because we there's been, been some fairs that have been very high profile that, that you know the senior management level is coming down saying, what are you going to do to fix this? So this, the simple mission was to improve the reliability of a complex batch asset. Blair, help me improve the reliability of this autoclave. The details of this autoclave, and if you know autoclaves, and especially if you know the life science industries, you can't just build redundancy 
tomorrow. So I can't just say, okay, well, this autoclave is failing. I'm going to build another autoclave. First of all, there's always the capital expense, but the time you validate it and do all that kind of work is just not feasible. So this autoclave was was the workhorse. It, it, it ran 24-7 with the exception of a Sunday every month where they did preventative maintenance. And what's also unique about this is there's 13 different batch cycles. So there's 13 recipes, that 13 ways this asset can run to produce the output of, of sterilizing um, either product or, or equipment, right? And that's really what comes down to it is the, the criticality, the how often it runs, and the 13 different batch cycles that cause the biggest problem. So my first recommendation, and I've always stuck to this, and, and if you live in the reliability community like I do, you'll always hear this, and you know, before you start any reliability project, and, and even with emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and IoT, you still have to build in the fundamentals. And I would challenge anyone that says, no, just give me your data, and I'll see what I can do, before even asking, how does this asset fail? What's its criticality? What's the risk priority number? Right? Those are very important things that I think we as reliability people need to make sure we maintain. No amount of technology will change bad control system or bad control design. So if your loops are out of control, there's no amount of artificial intelligence that's ever going to fix that problem. You need to make sure you have your loops properly tuned. You need to make sure you've, you know, if it's a really critical asset, you've done an RCM or you've done a failure mode and effect analysis. So if you get one takeaway from that is if you're going down an IoT or artificial intelligence journey, make sure you don't overlook the fundamentals. And that's exactly what we did with this autoclave. And very complex asset, very small footprint, but it's a it's a, a very complex asset with a I think 36 valves, probably about 10 or so check valves, safety relief valves. There's a there's a vacuum pump. Um, so we looked at the FMEA. And what we found there was about 150 failure modes that could have a control method using condition monitoring. So there's some kind of condition monitoring technology out there that would work to diagnose or, or to be able to detect a impending failure of one of these components on the asset. We also took the time to go through the previous failure history and that gives us good indication of what the bad actors are on that autoclave, right? And with any CMMS or, or ERP system, data can be challenging to get out. In this case, it, 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 it was limited. Where we found the most value was actually in the um, free form verbiage that people can put in. In this case, it was SAP. So the the um, failure codes and stuff were, were very limited, but we were able to dig a little bit deeper into the into the actual verbiage they put in there. And we found these common failures was the gasket seal, and that's the gasket seal around the door. And what they had is they had a PM in place to replace that gasket every every month, which is not uncommon to see. So if you've had a failure in the past, it's it's very natural in in, in industry for us just to say okay, the last time we replaced it was two months and it failed. So if we replace it every month, we're not going to have these failures anymore, right? So you design your time-based maintenance to try to fit into that window. And then, of course, if we, we've learned in reliability that, you know, the majority of, of failures are random. So they had a vacuum pump, which they're going to replace every two years, regardless if it's still working fine or not. Diaphragm valves, which they're going to replace every two years as well. And if you're in the life sciences, food and bev industries, specialty chemicals, um, cosmetics, things like that, you'll know the problems with diaphragm valves. They're, they're typically smaller valves than you see on oil and gas and other industries. Um, they are, since they are diaphragm valves, they're made of a, a, a polymer, right, that opens and closes it. That can wear out, very unpredictable wear out, although I've seen a lot of good case studies that does support there is a method to, to do the number of opening and closing, but it's very dependent on, obviously, the, the process parameters. So diaphragm valves and typical facilities will have thousands of these. And right now, I think the best technology is to just replace those every two years, regardless if they're working or not, right? So um, that's their way of dealing with this. Every two years, we're going to replace diaphragm valves. And this happens to be one autoclave, which has 35. But, you know, this particular facility, I think, has maybe 15 autoclaves. So you start doing the math on that, that gets very expensive. And then steam traps. And when we're looking at steam traps, you know, typically in, in these industries as well, you get down to very low pressures because you don't want very high pressures you'd see in, in power generation, oil and gas of, you know, 1,000 pound steam lines. These are, these are typically 15 pounds and below, which the technologies out there to detect steam traps are limited once you get to that um, lower pressure. And add the back the batch context to that makes it even harder because it could be off, could be on, could be off, could be on, could be off, right? So that made it very challenging. But we decided as a team that we were going to focus these and, and if we could tackle these top bad actors, we're not going to eliminate every failure. We're not going to eliminate someone from driving into it with a forklift or someone putting a paint can into the autoclave, um, which is a true story. But the, at least these are going to address the top bad actors. And that's that's what we set out to do. 
So if you've seen the slide and you've been following UE systems, this is their diagram. And this is a common technique that at Lakeside and the condition monitoring technicians we have at, at Lakeside that go around and do this. We do this as a service. So we check valves for leakage and things like that. We use our UE 15,000 gun and we measure A, B, C, D points. And, you know, if you're familiar with this, if, if the valve is leaking, you should see a higher decibel reading on the C reading because of the turbulence it's creating. So very common technology. We do it a lot in industries. What we settled to do was when, when this customer asked us, can you just, we, we're going to replace these valves soon. I'd rather not replace them all. Can you tell me if they're leaking or not? And I said, sure, I can do that. So we set out, I sent one of my best guys out there to go and, and do this ABCD reading. And the reality came in because he came out very shortly after, and they were actually running a cycle because you need the valves to, to be working, was what was happening was because the um, autoclave was, was functioning and it was obviously opening and closing these valves, which can be, you know, 30 times per minute, they can open very quickly, was the ultrasound was very erratic. And we also found that the readings of the ultrasound were very dependent on what was happening around that valve as well. So if there happened to be a parallel valve to this one, or that valve happened to feed the vacuum pump, if that vacuum pump would, would come on, you couldn't make head or tails of that ultrasound data. And I'm sure if anyone's done this, you've understand this where you've, you know, the, with condition monitoring technologies, what you really like is repeatable data, right? And it's very hard to do unless, you know, you, you, you capture it for one second over, you know, three years, you might be able to get every, every possible combination of data, right? So that was our biggest challenge. And what happened here, this, this was a fail. And I did have to go back to our client and said, you know, after trying this multiple times and we, we worked with the OEM manufacturer to figure out which valve is going to open and what state and, and what other things could be the influencing factors that would affect the ultrasound. It still didn't work. We did not have repeatable data and it wasn't for a lack of trying. It's just that they were so dependent on the other conditions of that autoclave. So I had to go back to them and said, I failed. Right, which is a difficult thing to do, especially as a, as a, you know, as a, as a vendor, as a consultant, uh, to your clients. It's a very difficult thing to say, but um, that was the reality of it. So that really what drove the project further was saying, okay, we can't predict um, the if these valves are working or not at this point in time. So we proposed, and I worked with uh, Gary at UE Systems to, you know, we can't have a guy in there 24 seven using the 15,000. And if these valves are critical enough, will it warrant an online system? And, and they said, absolutely, let's, let's try it. So I propose this solution where you'll see, you'll see this diaphragm valve, it's a Burkert diaphragm valve, and you'll see the UE 750, which is in, in my mind, and, and um, we can debate this, but it's essentially like a 15,000 wired up continuously. It's continuously giving me a decibel readings. So we could actually wire it so you could hear from it as well. So what it's doing is every 250 seconds, milliseconds, it's it's giving me an ultrasound reading in decibels, right? So even before we did that, the the client challenged me, said that that's great, but before I go out and, and put all these all over my valves, can you prove to me in a lab setting that it will detect a failure? And I said, absolutely. So what you see in front of you is the, the seat of that valve, and on the left-hand side is the, the test results. Now, we've done a lot more testing, and this is just one example of the testing. Um, but we, we, we try to simulate every possible combination of failure mode, so a crack in the diaphragm. In this case, what I'm showing there is a damaged seat, an airline coming out, a hole in the airline, all these things that would ch fundamentally change the ultrasound pattern downstream of the valve. So what you see is the, the blue line going across is when the valve's open. This happens to be 10 tests. Um, you can see very repeatable results every time that valve's open. We got, you know, just shy of 50 decibels. There, there was some, um, you know, 0 0.01 changes in the decibel readings, but it's very repeatable. On the valve closed, so when the valve's closed, if you look at, go back to that slide where it had the A, B, C, D, if the valve is truly closed, I expect to see a very low decibel readings on that C, right? And what we did is, after test number five, we, we, tried to simulate the best we could in, in getting the valve manufacturer's input on what that seat would look like after operating for two years. Because remember, two years is our, our we're going to replace these valves every two years. What would two years of, of simulation be in the harsh, harshest environment of opening and closing multiple times per second, right, and, and you know, running 24-7? And this is what we came up with. This is, we just kind of messed up the, the, the seat of that valve. It's, it's it, you know, I could show you actually more detailed pictures, but what you're seeing is a you know, small little cracks in the in the in the seat of that valve, 
And what we found was a very dramatic change once we did that. So very, you, you almost couldn't even hear the, the, it was just compressed air we used, the air leaking out. But what we did have was a very dramatic change in the decibel reading. So it didn't quite go up to the full open value, and, and which is good because I wouldn't want it to do that. But you can see it went up to about 40 decibels and it was very repeatable every time you opened and closed that valve. So what we did do is, yes, if that, if that valve had a leaky seat, we would be able to pick it up. And, and we have the same test for, as I said, a, um, you know, a cracked diaphragm valve, an airline coming out, things like that. So we did prove that in a, in a best case scenario, yes, we are going to see a change in the decibel readings, but more importantly, what we're going to see is a repeatable change in that. And that's really what we're looking at is repeatability at this point. Cause I don't care about accuracy. I don't care if it's 51 decibels or 52 decibels. What I care about in this application now, we are using ultrasound for rotating equipment and things like that, which I do care about the accuracy. But in this case, what I'm looking at is repeatability. Um, so in short, what we did is we wired the UE 750s. They're an analog signal. We brought them into a, a data acquisition unit. In this case, it was a it was a Delta V uh, digi digital control system, um, which we wired into a uh, very powerful system, which we can do a lot of uh, control strategies and stuff from it. Um, subsequent ones, we've, we've talked to Alan Bradley. We've done Optal 22 and a number of different host systems. But really what I want to get out of this is, this is the online traditional condition monitoring where we've added these sensors. Real-time data is being streamed every 250 seconds to a high-speed data acquisition unit. I have the ability to trend that data. What you see now is actually a live trend of, not live, but it was live at one point, of the ultrasound. And what I have circled there is the first three on the top are on steam traps. The, the bottom purple one is on a, on a valve, and you can see multiple valves in that picture, which I didn't include the trends. And really what I set out to do here was, my thinking was, and as I mentioned, I didn't think I needed artificial intelligence to solve this problem. Very stubborn. And I was going through, and what my thought was, I would be able to look at, you know, a run of a batch, for example, look at the ultrasound, and be able to do some basic math, some standard deviation, things like that, and just set simple thresholds. So, you know, on average, it didn't go past this for longer than two seconds, so I'm going to set, you know, uh, it's going to be a warning alarm at three seconds if it exceeds this threshold, right? What I found, and it was no different, and I should have foreseen this, is the ultrasound was so dependent on the cycle, the phase, the step, if the vacuum pump was on, all these other parameters that they were literally all over the map. And, and this is a good question because I showed this to the client, and, and they actually circled this point. They said, what happened here? Is this normal? And once again, I had to go back to them and said, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, right? And they, they challenged me, what did, what did I buy from you? I'm like, I'm still not sure yet, but I'm, I'm going down this journey together, right? And they were very supportive on this innovation because if you look at um, condition monitoring technologies, if you were to pick a gas turbine or a very critical pump, there's condition monitoring solutions out there, right, that, that provide, you know, these analytics, these threshold limits, these rule-based engines that you need to solve these problems. If you Google autoclave um, condition monitoring system or a packing line, packaging line, high-speed packaging line, condition monitoring system, there they're, they're aren't out there, right? And this is the challenge because they're so dependent and so have so many dimensions of data, right? So what we had to do next was we took the data because it, this, this trend here shows me nothing what the autoclave is doing. It's just showing me the ultrasound reading. When I challenged them, I said, I need context to that data. I need to know what that autoclave is doing so I can compare it to the ultrasound readings, and we, we're taking vibration, we're taking current, and all, the, all these other parameters as well. But this is what's called contextual data, right? So I needed to know the condition data, and I needed to know the process data. And what you're seeing here is what happens when you combine those two together. You can get incredible insights that, you know, I think everyone should be calculating, but it's very hard to get that data to. So your OEE, your availability, um, how much idle time you had, the number of batches run, comparative to the batches run yesterday, aborted batches and things like that. So by getting this data, you get a lot of information other than condition monitoring data, but you can get a lot of information that is very valuable that you know most people call are just general insights when you go down these projects. So if you're considering an IoT or AI project, also consider just some of the lower hanging fruit benefits you can get from it, such as these basic insights like OE availability and stuff like that. Um, so we have contextual data, and as I said, what I was going to do was I was going to take this contextual data and I was going to create rules, and I was going to create rules, and I was going to create more rules. So I took all this data. We had, you know, about 20 batches run. I'm going to sit down within my Excel spreadsheet, and I'm going to look at data, and I'm going to create the best rules they've ever seen. 
right? So I started making rules, and this is actually one of the first rules I wrote. If it's cycle 13 and PV220 is open and pump 101 is on, and all these other things, the alter sound, which is spelled wrong, should not be more or should be greater than 30 decibels, okay? That was one rule, one condition. What I found out was, what if it's PV220 is closed, right? Or what if the pump is not on? I got to create a different subset of rules for that. And what I was finding was I was creating hundreds of rules based on, I would run it, go, go look at the previous data and see if it would flag any alerts. And I was creating rule after rule after rule after rule. And that was just for one cycle. I said, okay, what's going to happen when I get into cycle 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, right? Are these rules going to apply? And because those cycles are so different, because they're different recipes, I had to create rules on top of rules on top of rules. And when I first engaged a data scientist, they looked at the data and they told me it was a factorial of 32 possible combinations for every data point I'm sending out, right? And, and that huge number below is the, the possibilities. Um, so when I looked at the factorial of 32 possible combinations that I have to create that would affect that ultrasound value for every valve. Although I want to think I could, I probably couldn't create enough rules to, to generalize that. And then if you look at, you know, the, the cry wolf syndrome, um, the last thing you want to do is create alerts that don't have any meaning or, or you saying, hey, this is an anomaly and it's actually not. Or vice versa is they have an anomaly and you miss it because as soon as that happens, you can lose buying and you can lose traction. Hey, this didn't work, right? So that's where I really started with this AI journey. And that's when I partnered up with, uh, so this was another fail. So if, you, if you're counting, I've been through two fails now and you start to tell why this client is an innovative client because they stuck with me and, and supported and went on this innovation journey with me. So that's when I first started partnering with Cortic.ai. So they're a, a um, artificial intelligence focusing in the industrial domain. And um, when I first started talking to them, I gave them this problem and, and I said, yes, this is, this is actually a perfect case for artificial intelligence. And what I liked about it was they were the first ones to tell me when I, when I started inquiring and working with them that AI is not here to solve all your problems, right? AI is this not magical fix. What it, it's not going to replace, as I said, it's not going to replace poor strategies. It's not going to replace poor reliability practices. If you have a bad planning and scheduling, there's no AI that's going to fix that. Although it might in the future as you apply, start to play AI to CMSs and things like that. But AI is there to solve your tough critical asset problems. Most of your problems can be solved with rule-based engines, right? So keep that in mind. Um, so what you're seeing is, is the, the gentleman's name we were working with at the client site was named Alfred. So we called this the Alfred. And what he wanted to say was, what I want to do before you do any black box, magical, artificial intelligence and start to give me these predictions and anomaly detections, I want my guys to experience this data. I want them to get to know their data. And that's where Contextualize came in. So what we're able to do, if you look on the screen in front of you, you're seeing a batch. Um, this is an ultrasound reading on, happens to be PV220, so you can see it's very all over the map. What you're also going to see is event frames. So you can tell when it's in post conditioning, when it's in heating up, when it's in exposure, um, when it's eventually cycle completed. So it's dissected that data for me because it's very important when you start comparing batches over batches, you need to compare apples to apples. So I don't want to compare the ultrasound reading when the valve is open and it's in this phase, and it becomes very important. And what I under over underestimated was how hard it actually is to provide those event frames and dissect data in a repeatable way where you can do what's called cohort analysis. So what you're seeing is a trend um, on February 5th. This is the ultrasound reading, okay? This next trend is that same ultrasound reading on the same valve done 151 days apart. So in that time frame, there's been 358 batches run. That valve can operate up to 60 times per um, cycle. So you start doing the math, that valve has opened and closed a heck of a lot of times in those 151 days apart. And what I challenge everyone with, and this is one of the humbling moments for me, is I guess I can't ask you because I can't get your answer, but in reality, when, when you look at this, does the pattern look the same? Does it have a similar pattern? Now, if there's any true engineers, PhDs on this phone, you're going to debate me in data scientists, you're going to start doing some statistical analysis and say, no, there's quite a difference. Um, but what you're, 
what you should see is yes, it follows the same peaks and valleys. There is a time offset because batch number two took a little bit longer in the heating up phase than it did in the in the first batch, which is 151 days prior. So if you start doing that time warping in your head, generally most people would say that that pattern looks the same. And that's what I was saying about the importance of repeatability. It's very important that these um, signals are repeatable, right? So what we just did, and if you go back to that failure test we did in the lab, right, where we saw a dramatic change of the ultrasound when we, when we induced a failure into that valve. So what I can say with confidence now for the first time ever to the client is I am confident based on the lab data I have and based on the repeatability and this pattern looking similar that that valve is working the same way it did 151 days apart. What I can't say is tomorrow if that valve is going to be working or not. I don't know that, right? And if I wanted to check tomorrow, I'd have to go in and do that exact same analysis and I would plot tomorrow's data over top of this data, right? It happens to be we've picked this February 5th data as a golden batch. Um, everything was operating the way it should, so I keep on repairing it to this one because it was, you know, when everything was new and shiny and things like that. So um, what it comes down to it, the, what we just did was we did some cognitive analysis Right, so we take a look at that example that we just did, and hopefully most of you agree that the pattern looked the same. Right, that was one variable, one trend over two batches. Right, in this case, this autoclave, we're looking at 50 variables, and we're looking at it every second. Right, so how would you possibly? And this goes back to that first question I asked, and it's no different than that radar screen example. Right, is it a missile or is it a jet? Obviously, the consequences of the first example are a little more extreme than this one, but. You know, it's essentially, it's that. How do you look at this data in real time and be able to process that much data, right? And that's and that's where um, the artificial intelligence really came in because that's what we're dealing with. We're looking at um, failure failure agents and anomaly agents, looking at this data in real time. Um, so. People have always asked, how are we getting data? How are you getting data into a AI platform? So as I said, we're taking the new condition monitoring sensors we've added. We're, at, we're adding the PLC data. When we add those two data, we have contextual data. We connect that, and we use what's called from Cortic.ai as a QNAC box. And what that allows us to do is to streamline data up into the cloud. It, it's doing a lot more. I'm not doing it justice from what's happening at the scene. And, and when we're talking about data, we're not talking about traditional process control data, right? If you think of your historians, you may have controlling your process now. You have to be very selective of what values you're sending to a historian because typically you pay by point and there's some storage limitations. So you might take a reading every 15 minutes, best case scenario, and aggregate that every 15 minutes, right? In this case, when we're doing anomaly detection, we didn't want that. We wanted real-time data streaming. Um, so what this QNet box is doing is it, it's, it's compressing some data, it's indexing the data, and I'll show you the power of doing that right at the edge. And uh, me personally, that's where I think the future of this technology is going to go, is a lot of this is going to reside on the edge. So we take that QNet data, we take this contextual data, we, we get it to the QNet box, it does this magic. It sends it up to the Microsoft Azure cloud. The reason we picked Azure at this time was because you know it, it, it is Microsoft. A lot of industrial users already have Microsoft. A lot of your data could already be in the Microsoft Azure cloud, right? It's very secure from, from end to end. And what's happening is we're taking that data, and that's where we start to we use the Demi platform, uh, contextualize, which was actually what I showed you those graphs being. So all that data that I'm collecting. So what's happening is if I look at those 50 data points that we have, we're taking that value every second, okay? That ends up to be about 11 million data points in the autoclave. So when we do that 11 million points a day, right, it, it, it seems like a lot when you're talking about 11 million data points a day. In my mind, we're still not really in the big data. It's 11 million point data points that are changing every second. Well, some might not be changing, but there is a cost of fluid motion with these. So 11 million data points a day, right? That's something you wouldn't put into a traditional historian for, this, for these types of projects, right? So this is an overview of what we're looking at from um, the system architecture. I'm not going to dive too deep in this. This is some feedback. A lot of people are saying I'd like to see what's happening. So we have some vibration transmitters that we're doing on the vacuum pump. We have some current transformers where we're measuring the current of the, the motor itself to get some diagnostics into the overall motor health. Um, the wired ultrasounds, these are the 750s that we have wired in here. And this is how we're connecting to the existing PLC. 
and in this case, it was a very, very old uh, uh, Slick 05, a 30-year-old uh, Allen Bradley, uh, which we were able to connect to no problem. And then here's the QNAC gateway that sends this data to the to the cloud very efficiently. So that's what it looks like. Again, if, if you want information on how we hook things up and, and more dive deep into the system architecture, I'd be happy to do that after this after this webinar. Um, so now that we have data, so we have data, we have data going to the cloud, right? What we still don't have yet is any anomaly agents looking at this data, right? And one, that's one of the biggest challenges is, you know, how much data do you need? What data do you need in order to make a AI or IoT project be valuable, right? And when, when it comes down to, you know, especially from the predictive maintenance side, and that's where I've lived the last 15 years, um, I think the latest survey from Plant Services Magazine was 83% of condition monitoring or predictive maintenance programs are not achieving the value that people set out to achieve from that, right? And, and there's a lot of issues, in my opinion, it comes down to culture. Um, obviously, training has a big impact on it. Um, what I've also found is that when you put the power of condition-based maintenance or predictive maintenance into the power of the people using it and making decisions, that drives adoption better. So what's happening here is, is if you were to give data to a data scientist, they built a model and they send you down, here's this magical model that's gonna give you the results you needed, right? First of all, would you trust that, right? Because you didn't make it, you didn't have any input into it. And second of all, what if something changes? Something very drastic, but it does require a change in the model, right? So I moved a valve three inches to the right or, or something like that. You don't want to have to go through the process of giving it back to a data scientist, training them all and giving it back, right? And that's what really drove me towards Cortic is the fact that they're allowing industrial users like me to, to build artificial intelligence. Um, they keep on saying they want to make it so simple that Blair could use it, so I, I get offended by that a little bit, but that's the reality where I am an industrial user. I know nothing about data scientists, although I, I, I learned a lot in the last two years than I thought I ever would. Um, but that is one of the biggest benefits. So what we're doing here is we're, we're selecting this data and we've had data being streamed up in this case, let's say 20 batches, right? What I want to do is be able to select what is good. So if I want to do a baseline and I want to, I want to create a model to tell me what's good and what's bad, right? I need to know what data to say, yes, AI model, take this data and learn what's good. And I can do this through this program. So I can select this data, have this data set up. And in this case, what I actually did was I picked some dates. I also excluded some dates because we had some exclusions in there, which we're going to show was actually one of our, our case studies where it wasn't ideal, even though it was part of a, I, um, the golden batch time frame. It wasn't ideal because they had a um, critical utilities failures was shut down the autoclave. It wasn't a result of the autoclave. Um, being in a failure condition, but the utilities that fed it shut down. So I don't want to train the model on that. So what we essentially do is you take the data, you figure out which data is is good data to to form a baseline, and that's essentially what we did. So we 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 took about 20 batches. We we were we were positive that um, during these data frames that we have the algorithm would see every possible combination. So there's a leak test being done once once a month. Right, it's a cycle zero. It's very rare, but it happens once a month. I want to make sure I copied that. So even during a simple leak detection cycle, I can still do anomaly detection on it. Right. So we picked this time frame. I talked to production. We talked to maintenance. We said production, when was this autoclave acting as it should? It completed on time. Maintenance, did you get called in during this time frame to? Did you tweak? Did you adjust anything? Nope. So that's that's our golden batch. Um, the other things is. As I said, and I'm speaking directly to the to the ultrasound in this one, and we can dive into vibration if we have time. But one of the other big factors is not only do you have to pick which you know your time frame of your data set is is good, but you also have to decide out of that variable. So if I want to make a predictor to or, or anomaly detector on this ultrasound value that I have downstream of the valve, I need to know what influencing factors affect that ultrasound signal. So if you think of that valve. Obviously, an open and closed signal is going to affect that ultrasound very dramatically. But as I said, there could be the vacuum pump because it feeds the vacuum pump. And if you think of ultrasound and a vacuum pump comes on, obviously, that's going to create a lot of turbulence and a lot of noise and change that ultrasound signal. Or if it's a parallel valve, if that valve open and closing. So this is where domain knowledge and data science come together. And what happens here is you can see the Deming platform giving us on the left-hand side what it sees from the data as the influencing factors. And I'm allowed to build a number of different models to see which gives me the best results. So in this case, it got it dead on um, in terms 
terms of what the influencing factors are, the, cycle, the phase cycle step and, and the actual PV220 being open. In some cases, when we built this, I trumped what data science was telling me because my domain knowledge said, no, no, no. I know for a fact that this has a big influencing factor. It's just that the data hasn't seen it yet, right? So that, that gives me the ability to create different models to see which is giving me the best results. And this is where you start to see that anomaly um, detector or anomaly agent come in. And what you're seeing here is known anomalies deserve this. It's, it, I gave it a training, um, sorry, a testing data set that has known anomalies. In this case, we put anomalies in it and made sure that we could detect it, right? And we're not going to get into it, but there is a different method if you don't have anomalies, because what you don't want to do is, is go down a AI or IoT journey and have to mess up your equipment in order to prove that it works, right? That's a big challenge we have, is that who, who wants to mess up their critical equipment to prove that this is going to work, right? Or do you want to wait two years for a failure and then train your models? So no, you need to be able to, um, with data, simulate a failure. Um, so what is this doing on the, on the, the plot you see in front of you is a scatter plot, and this is the anomaly score, and what the Deming platform is doing, every second that I'm setting a variable up and I'm sending 50 variables a second, it is giving me back in return an anomaly score from zero to 100. Zero is, that's exactly what I thought it would be, that's what my model's been trained for, Phil, so if you said this valve is open and the valve's open, that's a score of zero, right? Or the ultrasound should be at 45 and it's 45, that's a score of zero. All the way up to 100, 100 is completely opposite, so it's a true anomaly. And what you're going to see is you see some scatters of the orange, right? And on the right-hand side, you'll see the plot of the ultrasound signal. So there is some anomalies that are happening in there. And again, this was staged, and it picked up these anomalies in this data set. And I said, yes, that's, that's exactly that. In this case, it was model B that had the greatest results of picking up these known anomalies. So as we zoom a little deeper into that, right, anomaly score, which is very powerful. So it's given me, it has learned the factorial of 32 different combinations, and it's learned this in a very, very short time. Less than an hour, these models were built, right, with the, with the help of, of Cortic and, and Xiao doing this. But these models were built and learned that data. So it's giving me these anomaly scores every, every second, right? And it's, it's essentially plotting these. So you see a high cluster of, of the zero mark, which is good. You start to see some orange dots up here. This one may have hit 90, um, for example, the highest point here, the orange dot. But that's one anomaly for one second at a very high score. Okay, and if you go back to the lab test results we did, and if there's any domain expertise of valves, or even when you get to a bearing and things like that, do you expect to see a failure of any component for a second then go away, right? Um, typically, a failure is going to be there, and it's actually actually going to gradually degradate over time, right? So you're going to see small changes. So the fact that I see anomaly score of 90 for one second, and it quickly goes back down to, you know, well, well below limits, I'm not worried about that. It's when you start to see patterns that look like this. Now, this happened to be June 9th, but this is the case study we're going to show. So you'll see a very high concentration of anomaly scores way up here in the 100 mark, and then, you know, this very high concentration. What you're seeing on the right-hand side is the ultrasound signal, and it's actually turning orange where it's very anomalous, right? This is a challenge. This was a known anomaly. And what we're actually seeing here is the effect of no compressed air being fed to the autoclave. Okay, so we're, the, the autoclave might be saying, hey, valve open, or, or the autoclave might just be holding the valve closed or open, and it's not um, either reaching its, its full closed or full open position. So that's where we start to see these anomalies, right? So you start to see, you know, the question I gave to you guys at the start of this was, you know, if you had one person sitting there looking at an asset and looking for anomalies, essentially we're doing that with artificial intelligence now. We have 50 um, anomaly agents watching over the autoclave every second of every day. And the key factor to this is, it's not just when it's in operations. Even when that autoclave is just sitting there saying, hey, I'm ready to start, it's still um, calculating anomaly score on all those 50 different components, right? So if you start to, you know, do some ideation in your head, okay, if I have, you know, if I had to do a different setup for this cycle 13 and I don't have the valve in the right condition or this, this manual valve open and things like that, right, it will detect that even while it's sitting there. Um, so... One of the other takeaways from this is, and I'm going to explain it at the end of my presentation, but when you get into the IoT and artificial intelligence is there's also value in, in taking the sensors that are existing on the piece of equipment itself, right? Not too many industries don't have 
at least some level of automation where you're measuring pressure, you're measuring temperature, things like that. In this case, this is the same scatter plot for vibration. What I like about this, and and uh, I'm sure there's some vibration guys on here that are going to want to talk to me after, but this is actually, we're looking at a peak view value from, from Emerson, um, which we're not going to get into peak view, but you see, I, I can tell by looking at this graph on the right-hand side when that exact that vacuum pump started up, right? It, it, it reached its... Uh, kind of running speed and then shut off and again start it up, shut off, start it, shut off, right? And we see those trends and that's what's very hard for vibration as well as ultrasound. When you have batch processes, when things are starting up, it's very hard to get that sweet spot, repeatable spot to take those measurements. So we're doing an anomaly detection on vibration. This happens to be on current. If you read a lot of the articles now about detecting motor failures, um, current and voltage seems to be a big one. You know, if you have a typical inrush current, um, you should see it flatten out. Um, if you have current imbalance, things like that. So we're doing anomaly detection on current as well. And this is pressure as well. So you'll start to see um, this pressure already existed on there. We're just taking this value from the PLC and doing anomaly detection on that as well. Right, so it's not just the additional sensors we've added. There's also a lot of value you can get from doing an omni detection on the current sensors you have. So the other the other question I have is, what if you could see in the future? Because we have this data and we have data streaming in live, um, we can also create different model types. So we've created a anomaly agent or, or uh, uh, anomaly failure detection using a different type of model. But they've also created a different model for me, which is actually predicting the future. And what you see here is the green line is the predicted ultrasound value, and the blue is actually the real-time value coming in. So I can predict out, in this case, we're doing it um, 15 minutes, of what that ultrasound is going to look like. Now, the value in ultrasound is, is not that impressive, but when you start to think about it, what if you're predicting what the pressure would be, or, and what, that's what we're doing, or the temperature could be, right? What if that we see the change in 15 minutes, and it crosses the alarm threshold, or it crosses the abort cycle, right? We can tell you, hey, based on this, we have a 89% confidence based on the way this is running, that in 15 minutes you're going to cross this alarm threshold and shut down that autoclave. So a very powerful statement, and that's what we're working on now. Um, so this is, a, this is a great case study, and this goes back to my question was, would you start a batch if you knew there was anomalies before starting a batch? So this happened to be on June 9th, and at 10.24 we had six very high anomalies come in, and the way for this case study, what I created rules based on low, medium, high, and they have a different duration of the anomaly score. So, if, for example, I put a low, um, uh, if it's uh, anomaly score of, of 60 and it was continuous for five seconds, then give me a low. And I made up different rules all the way to high. If it's above 95 for 30 seconds, then give me a high anomaly, right? And we went back and tested it on the, on the previous data. So what was happening at 10.24 p.m. on June 9th, we had six anomaly scores, high anomaly scores come in. Even though they came in high, the operation still decided to run a batch. So at 11.29, almost an hour later, they started a batch number 10.596. So they started a batch. About another half hour into that batch, we had another five high anomalies come in. Right? So we started to see, so that if you're doing the math, we're about 11 anomalies come in. And the batch at this point is started, and once you start a batch, you can't just simply say, hey, pause, I'll get back to you later, right? The batch is going, you've committed to running it now. At 12.01, so we're, you know, an hour, sorry, half an hour, 32 minutes prior to starting the batch, we had another two valves come in at a very high anomaly. And, and you can start to see why, because as these, as the um, process starts to open and close valves, you start to detect more anomalies. What ended up happening was at 12.23, so this is two hours prior to our first anomalies coming in, we had a compressed air low alarm come in. This is hard-coded in the PLC for this autoclave. Something that I don't control is just simply, hey, it's a, it's a dumb pressure switch. I don't have enough compressed air to run this autoclave anymore. And at 10, uh, 12, 25, the batch aborted. So we're at about two hours that batch aborted. If we go back two hours, we, we had six anomaly high alarms. And the, the consensus was Blair, if I had known this and if, you, and, and if I had paid attention to these anomalies, I wouldn't have started that batch. I would at least ask the question, why are these high? And what was happening behind the scenes was there was compressed air failure. Uh, there's two compressors that feed a main header. Main header runs at 100 PSI. What was happening was, for some reason, these two compressors were struggling to keep up with the air demand. So if you think about it, as other equipment tried to draw air, it would bring down that air pressure. It wouldn't bring it down where it would trip the 
um, the autoclave, it would just modulate quite a bit, and that's when we started to pick up these high anomalies because there wasn't enough air pressure to completely shut off those valves or completely open those valves, and the pattern changed, right? So this was kind of an eye-opening moment that we were saying, yes, you know, we knew about this two hours prior to you actually getting that aborted alarm. Um, so the question is, would you have started that batch with six high-level anomalies? And it doesn't matter if it was a continuous, continuous process or batch. Chances are no. It, and, and where I see AI and these solutions fitting in is under critical assets. So chances are, if they're a very critical asset and there's a lot of you know, time and money invested into these, you wouldn't start that. You would take the time to diagnose and look at the root cause to see why these are anomalies are high. Um, so here's my, my lessons learned from this, and I know I went over it pretty quickly. Um, but again, I think it's very important to go over these. So no algorithms or data can substitute a workaround for good reliability practices. And I'll preach this until the day I die. This is not meant to replace good planning and scheduling. It's not meant to replace RCM, FMEA. I think you can use AI and skip those steps. I think you're setting yourself up for failure. Humans play the most critical role in making algorithms successful. Um, I think this is huge. So don't, again, don't go down an AI journey without bringing domain experts and challenging the vendor you're using to let those domain experts play a role in that, not only to make sure these algorithms will do what you want them to do, but also bring um, the culture change you need back in the plant to drive success of adoption of these. Um, again, black box approach for machine learning um, impedes the adoption of this technology. So if you just have a black box spitting out answers, right, it's not gonna work. IoT is not just about adding new sensors. You have sensors, and I probably, between uh, Emerson and the local business partners, we probably sold you a lot of those sensors. The rose mount, the fissure control valves, things like that. Those have tremendous insights into them. Don't think you need to go and instrument these, everything. Um, be very specific, and, and what you should instrument should come out of your FMEA. And in this case, in pharmaceutical and, and in food and bed, we did all of these um, and we've done autoclaves, fermenters, HVACs. We've done a lot of things where we've done them with all, without affecting the validation. So everything we've done has been non-intrusive, right? We were able to listen to a PLC with available ports. We're able to strap on ultrasound outside of the pipe, so we're not actually going into the process, right? So all this can be done with very limited impact to production quality validation and things like that. And then um, the, I think the, the my, my takeaway from this journey, and, and, and hopefully it resonated with you guys as well, was this was an experiment to innovate. We didn't set out and we didn't go and just buy an autoclave condition monitoring system or a fermenter or an HVAC off the shelf, right? The journey alone um, brought so much culture change and innovation and adoption of this technology into this customer site because they were with it every, every step of the way. Um, so I invite you to, if you have any questions, of course, Maureen will, will hopefully share the questions with me, but uh, I left my email address on here um, for, for Lakeside. If you want to find out more about AI and have some really in-depth conversations or questions about artificial intelligence and how to apply it, feel free to follow uh, Cortic on LinkedIn or go to info at Cortic.ai and uh, they can answer your questions from, uh, from the AI point of view. I'll pass it to you, Maureen, see if there's any questions. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Blair. Great, great presentation. And yeah, we're really entering kind of this new new age with with all kinds of options. Sky's the limit, right? Um, so a couple questions came in, and folks, you know, feel free to to get some more in. We've got a little bit of time. Um, so with what you were doing, would most autoclaves um, have the same types of problems that you were seeing? Is that going to kind of run yes. across all of those? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, no, very, very good question. I won't spend too much time on it. But what we're seeing is the adoption of these assets that are scalable. So, if you think about an autoclave, is very repeatable, especially when you get into OEM equipment. What I like about this is that uh, this OEM, um, it's it's cookie cutter. Um, it's exactly the same. I think 13 out of the 15 are exactly the same, exact same setup. When you start to get around HVACs and other things, it's it's a very repeatable. So there is a level of acceleration around digital transformation that you can do when you've done one asset. There is a little bit more elbow grease with the first asset, but it gets very repeatable after that. All right. Um, are there other applications that you're thinking of applying um, artificial intelligence to? Yeah. So there, there, as I said, there's a there's a wide range of what we're doing. Um, we're we're um, we're, we're doing some artificial intelligence on um, vibration monitoring and things like that to do first pass analysis. Our, our, our goal is to actually challenge um, um, the, um, 
level two vibration and get AI to, to, to pass it just just like you saw Watson beat the Jeopardy player and things like that. So um, we're applying it to vibration. We're providing, we're doing it for yield prediction and things like that as well, not just predictive maintenance. Where you see the biggest adoption right now of artificial intelligence is on predictive maintenance because there's a lot to gain from that. Um, but you're starting to see it on yield predictions and other things like that as well. All right. Um, and kind of on the cost side, is it expensive? Um, a couple of folks are asking, you know, what's kind of the cost of applying AI to, to your data? Yeah. No. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a very good question. And I was humbly surprised on that too. And, and think of me as a, as a, uh, I, I'm an integrator. I contracted Cortic.ai so I could speak to the pricing. Um, the majority of the cost came from the hardware and sensor side of things. The AI was probably the least costly venture to do this, um, which I was surprised. So, and when, it, when it comes down to time, the biggest, and, and you'll often see this with, in, if you follow any data science um, forums or blogs, majority of the time data scientists spend is not actually doing artificial intelligence and true data scientists, it's, it's doing data cleansing or data hygiene is what they call. So that was our biggest challenge of, you know, get, um, getting the data out of there, sending it through the cloud, getting through the firewall. That was the biggest, um, the biggest challenge, not the actual AI. As I said, the AI was done very quickly and provided results very quickly. Cool. Um, and then someone just wrote in, during your journey, did you uncover any factors that would predict a diaphragm valve failure? Yes, we did, and it's something I didn't show here, and, and uh, whoever that person was, you can feel free to, to reach out. But yes, we, we can predict a diaphragm valve failure, and that's why the, the likes of uh, the Burkerts and all that are, are, are talking to us now, because we can predict it. So what we're doing is we're essentially um, anomaly detector, right, which is different than condition monitoring, because if you look at vibration technology, there's so many rules set out there that if it's, I'm going to make this up, I'm not a vibration guy, but if it's two times order or two times um, your, your, your speed, it's an inner race defect, right? What we're doing here is we're not saying that, hey, this is a diaphragm valve failure, or this is a seat failure. What we're saying that this valve is anomalous, right? There could be a lot of things that drive it and where we get, and that's why I recommend doing this through critical assets because most people would just then replace that valve, go back to a root cause analysis, say this is a diaphragm valve failure or diaphragm failure. And then what you could actually do is learn that pattern and learn the effect of what happens on that specific valve if it is a diaphragm failure and, 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 and warn yourself in the future. But yeah, we, we, we can do diaphragm valve failures, airline leaks in airlines, uh, the seat failures, a bunch of different failure modes on that valve. All right, cool. Well, since we've got just a couple minutes left, I'm going to uh, change the screen back here to me and just go over a couple last minute kind of closing out slides. But again, Blair, thank you so much. Um, and as you saw, you know, he had his email up on there. Um, so if you want to reach out to Blair, have you, if you have follow-up questions, um, as you're kind of thinking through this presentation once we're done, um, feel free to reach out to him. If you want to reach out to us to get us in touch with Blair, you know, whatever you need to do, we'll, we'll get you guys hooked up. Um, but just some closing slides. So just um, a little information about um, some additional training in addition to these webinars we do each month that UE Systems offers. We do have four online training classes available now, mechanical inspection and lubrication, compressed air, electrical inspections, and we just are launching our steam trap inspection inspection course. So folks will probably see an email about that tomorrow as well as some special holiday pricing that we're going to be offering. So um, if any of these applications are something that you're trying to dig in on or get started with, um, just a great opportunity to kind of get that education at your desk without having to, to, to go anywhere. So um, just wanted to point those out. Um, we do, you know, want to stay connected with you guys in between these, these sessions. So if you've got questions or um, kind of your own ideas on, on what Blair was talking about today, definitely post those in our Ultra Probe users group on LinkedIn. Great place to kind of keep keep those connections going with, with your peers in the, in the industry. Um, follow us on Twitter. And I'll leave our contact info up. I'm pretty sure everybody knows how to get in touch with me since you get all the emails from me. So, so don't be shy. Uh, definitely reach out if you've got questions um, and we'll, we'll steer you in the right direction. But uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Blair, thanks again to you. And I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thank you.